from engaging in personalities toward the president. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., May 25th, 2023. I hereby designate the period from Friday, May 26th, 2023 through Sunday, June 4th, 2023 as a district work period under Section 3Z of House Resolution 5. Signed sincerely, Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 9th, 2023, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, for 30 minutes. Thank you. Uh, most of the discussion in this building over the last few weeks has been on the debt limit, and I guess I should lead off by addressing it a little bit. A lot of the American public is thinking, why are people fighting on this bill? What difference does it really make? Let's get us behind us. I want to leave the American public with two reasons why at least the Republican Party wants a little bit more fiscal restraint than otherwise would happen. First of all, the debt is now 100% of GDP. That is the first, it's just shy of that. That's the first time that's happened since World War II. But at the end of World War II, we knew we were going to lay off millions of people in the military. We're going to stop making ships. We're going to stop making planes. We're going to stop making tanks. And there'd be a dramatic reduction in government spending. And that's exactly what happened. And slowly, the debt fell from 100% to a little over 20% of GDP before recently rocketing up, in part due to the COVID and in part due to President Biden's rec reckless spending. So now we are at 100% of GDP. But all we see in the future is more people retiring, more money spent on Social Security, more money spent on Medicare, which we can never cut either one of those two programs. We should not, which means we've got to exercise fiscal restraint everywhere else. And the time to do that is now. If we do not dial things back a little now, it's going to get that much worse next year and that much worse the year after it. The other thing I want to leave the American public with is as interest rates are going up, we right now are spending every year about $2,000 per man, woman, and child on interest rates alone. If you are a family of four, think about that. Every year you've got to start by paying $8,000 just to cover your share of the federal debt. That is a disaster. If we don't address it now, it's going to be worse next year. The Republican position is very moderate. Probably the public would be outraged if they found out how moderate the Republican position is. We do not plan on balancing the budget this year, even if the Republicans got all they asked for, and they're not going to get all they asked for. But even if they got all they asked for, it would still result in a significant increase in debt over the next year. But the brake should be put on a little bit. We should acknowledge the problem. The Republicans love your children. They love their grandchildren. They don't want to see the country that much more in debt, and we're worried we're approaching the point of no return. So in any event, I, I want, I'm proud of my Republican leadership that their attitude is we have to do something when we see debt equal to 100 percent of GDP. And when the, every American is paying $2,000 of interest by itself, the only responsible thing to do is put up a little bit of fight. And I wish some of the Democrat leadership would acknowledge more that something's got to be done. However, despite the fact that this is the most covered issue in America, President Biden recently addressed the graduating, the graduates of Howard University here in town. And he felt one of the major issues of the day is white supremacy. Um, I do not think we should let such an inflammatory, divisive bit of rhetoric go unanswered. And it's not the first time President Biden has done this. This has been a theme whenever he speaks to the American public as a whole. He talked about it 
in his inaugural speech where he mentioned racism four times and white supremacy once. He talked about it in his State of the Union speech this year where he attacked our police and one more time called them racist. And now going before the Howard commencement speech, a time for a positive speech, a time to tell the graduates they have their whole life ahead of them and you can do anything in America. President Biden got in the mud and talked about white supremacy. Um, first of all, we have to address, do we have a problem in America in which people cannot succeed? There have been numerous speeches dealing with police and racism, and the studies show that racism is not a problem. That when you look at people being shot when adjusted for crimes committed, if anything, white people are more likely to get killed than black people in a confrontation with police. Nevertheless, President Biden, Mr. Negative, decided to use um, his annual speech to Congress to trash the police and refer, them, refer to them as being racist. Now, are people who are not of European descent having problems in this country? Well, we looked at people from different countries around the world. And, and again and again, well, first of all, again and again, we find people from all around the world coming here. I got a list of the countries that people give up their citizenship to and become American, the top 10 countries, one Mexico, two India, three Philippines, four Cuba, five Dominican Republic, six China, seven Vietnam, eight Jamaica, nine El Salvador, 10 Colombia. You know what I'm saying about those countries? None of them are European countries. People from all around the world are desperate to come in the United States legally. If America were all a country in which you were punished, if you weren't of European descent, you would not see the 10 countries most commonly coming here being from places other than Europe. I have heard that a significant number of Russians are coming here, but I have been at the border probably seven or eight times over the last three years. Again, I see people from Africa, Central America, Middle East. I have attended ceremonies in which people were sworn in as citizens uh, in Milwaukee. And when I've showed up at these ceremonies, I would be surprised if 5% of the people becoming Americans are from Europe. This weekend, I'm going to attend a Memorial Day, a Memorial Day event for the Hmong. The Hmong, for those of you who don't know, are a group of people, primarily but not exclusively from Laos, who came to this country after the Vietnam War and were allowed in this country because they did so much to help fight communism on behalf of the Americans. Uh, when the Hmong came here, they frequently did not know English. Many of them were not Christian. As a matter of fact, for many of the Hmong, they knew no written language of any sort at all. Nevertheless, they've come here and they thrive. Again and again, when I talk to members of the Hmong, how are your children doing? How are your nieces and nephews doing? I get stories like between me, my children and nieces and nephews, they're 20, they're 25 kids. Every one of them is successful. Everyone's doing well in school. None of them are committing any crimes. Uh, they're all having children in a family situation. And I, I, I cannot help but think, watching the tremendous success story of the Hmong, how could any president say America is a difficult country to live in if you are not European? Then I look at income, and I realize there are many definitions of success. I am not somebody at all who says economic success is the most important. But you look at the numbers insofar as they're available on the internet. I look at India, which seems to be right now the financially most successful subgroup in America, making 80% more than the average American. India, a country in which a relatively small number of people are considered Christian, overwhelmingly Hindu, to a lesser degree Muslim. I look at uh, Philippines, 50% more, Sri Lanka, 34% more, Japan, 30% more, Malaysia, 25% more, Pakistan, 18% more. People coming here from Cuba, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Latin American, 
uh, 15% more than European Americans is what they make. It's harder to find some other information, but Thomas Sowell, who I think very highly of, wrote a book called Ethnic America 40 years ago. And at that time, Thomas Sowell pointed out that the average second generation person from the Caribbean was making more than the average American, and that, of course, is largely uh, people of black descent, people from Bahamas, people from Jamaica. So again, the tremendous financial success of people coming from all around the world makes one realize that America does not have a huge racial problem. Uh, does American, but another question is, does American discriminate in favor of European? people of European descent? And the answer is right now, under our affirmative action programs in this country, whether you are looking at hiring government people, whether you are looking at businesses who contract with the government, do at least $10,000 of business with the government, um, they are required to fill out a form, an EEO-1 form, in which they list the race of all their employees. And when they fill out that form, because they are afraid of being sued, um, they, the average American business is very conscious and is sometimes even told by their advisor to hire people who are not white. Uh, affirmative action began in 1965 in this country in earnest. It was around a little bit before that, but in earnest in 1965. We're talking over 50 years ago. Original affirmative action was designed primarily to help black people, but in the interim, we added Asian people, and this, by the way, is typical of affirmative action around the, around the world. Um, it starts with one group, and then every other group says, I want the government to weigh in on my behalf. So we add Asian, Pacific Islander, Latin American, um, added women, uh, and uh, now um, we recently have had the Biden administration weigh in and say we want to add people of Middle Eastern or North African descent. So we want to add people from Syria, from Iraq, from Algeria to the list of people who should get preferences. You'll notice, uh, not white. Um, this comes into play in forms that have to be filled out when we say who is going to be getting government contracts, um, who is going to be getting into colleges and universities, who is going to be the owner of business that gets government contracts. So it is very pervasive in our society. I bet very few Americans, I've tried, are aware that when a big business, say even a business with 100 employees, a business with 50 employees, when they hire someone and they have a government contract, they are paying attention or have to fill out a form as to the race and gender of that person. And as a practical matter, uh, it causes people to be a little bit less reluctant uh, to hire people who have historically been here in America. Now, I think these programs, when they implement them, are designed to be as divisive as possible. First of all, um, in order to qualify as, as a favored group, uh, you self-identify. and. If you are one half or one quarter or one eighth a member of that group, you can say, I am a member of the protected class. I'm not sure that's right. It obviously is wrong. People wouldn't even know if someone who is one quarter Native American, one quarter uh, whatever, um, is a member of that class. But you get to check off that box and get the benefits. Wealth has no no, nothing to do with it. You can be born into a family worth millions and millions of dollars, but if you're from the right ethnic group, or at least one quarter or one eighth a member of the right ethnic group, uh, you get to be checked off uh, on that form. And it can again be true, even if a person wouldn't guess you're a member of that minority. It affects university admissions. And for quite a while, we've had a string of cases. One case is working through the Supreme Court right now of, again, trying to give preferences to people who are one half, one quarter, one eighth members of a minority. Uh, to push it even further lately on schools or graduate schools, they are removing uh, 
SAT scores or MCAT scores that traditionally people have to take these tests to make sure that, for example, the best and the brightest are getting, getting into medical school. But we're taking that off the table in an increasing number of medical schools again because they are afraid that they will be letting in too many people of traditional ethnic backgrounds in America. We are doing the same thing lately with regard to loans given out by banks, which is kind of amazing. But now bankers have to collect. They're going to soon do it for commercial lending. They've done it in the past for residential lending. What is the race or gender or even sexual preference? Uh, apparently, because the government likes to look over the shoulder of these banks and make sure that they're not discriminating based on race or discriminating based on, on uh, sexual preference. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe that that's going on now, but it is. They really keep track of these banks. I talked to a banker a little while ago. He had to put down on the form what the race is of the guy who plowed the snow in his parking lot. Now you might say, why is that any of the government's business and what are they doing? Well, we know why they're doing it. Because they want to put pressure on the banks to feel that that's, a, that's something that should be taken into account before you, uh, before you fill out that contract. Um, so this becomes more and more part of the American background. Um, I, I recently ran into a gal who told me she worked for a bank and they had an opening for months, but they couldn't fill that opening because all her applicants were white guys. Now, I don't know if she's right or wrong on that, but talking to some other bankers, that's entirely possible. And we should have a discussion whether that's right. You have to say, where is this ending? What is the goal of the Biden administration? A study was done a little while ago on the federal judiciary. I wish we had these studies for all other appointments by the Biden administration. And apparently his first two years, President Biden had appointed 97 federal judges. Of the 97 federal judges, I was expecting maybe 25 or 30 were white guys, because I know President Biden wasn't heavy on appointing more white guys. Five of the 97 judges were white guys. Of those, two were gay. So um, almost impossible for a white guy who's not gay, apparently, to get appointed here. To a certain extent, that was not just President Biden's fault. Not long after he was sworn in, two Democrat senators, one from Illinois and one from Hawaii, said that they did not want to vote to confirm any more President Biden's appointees if they were white men unless they were gay. Um, Again, the definition of diversity, and more and more they're talking about a diversity as being uh, part of the reason here. Uh, as far as the idea that where your ancestors come from will determine what a good doctor you are or what a good electrician you are or whatever, seems a little bit ridiculous. I mean, think, for example, of a, a, an example. Let's say my maternal grandfather was Peruvian and he died before I was born. Well, the idea that giving me a special place in college or a special uh, job in management so I can bring the Peruvian viewpoint to the table would be ridiculous. We're talking about a grandfather who had nothing at all, uh, was never in Peru, never met him, but that is the way the current system works and it's something that should be discussed. Now, what is the Biden team doing now that's going to affect this very pernicious programs uh, in America? The first thing they're going to do is they're going to add another protected class, Middle Eastern, North African people. Right now, you're considered Asian. If you are from Japan, we can go around the map, Japan, China, Thailand, Pakistan, India. But it stops in Pakistan. There's no preferences if you're from Egypt or Algeria or Syria. The Biden administration wants to end that. And end that even though affirmative action began in the 1960s, so almost all people of this descent were not even in America prior to that, but they want to be a new group that should be getting preferences. I think that should be discussed in America's news pages. Uh, instead, it's not even brought up that it's happening. The next thing the Biden administration is doing is they are 
um, putting new diversity equity teams in every one of the government agencies, be it commerce, defense, agriculture, energy, health and human services, homeland security, justice, labor, transportation. Every agency is getting a new group to weigh in on diversity and to make sure that the right people are getting jobs in that agency, if there are grants going out on that agency again, to make the right, sure the right people are getting grants. In other words, the Biden administration wants to greatly increase the power and uh, the power of this class of people in picking whoever gets anything around society. It can't just be like it used to be, let's take the best person. Uh, these new programs, I think, cause one to say some more questions ought to be raised by the American public and answered by the Biden administration. Do we care about merit anymore? Should these programs benefit millionaires? Right now, if you are worth $20 million, but you apply for a government contract, you're given preferences, despite the fact you're already wildly wealthy. And by the way, Thomas Sowell, when he writes about affirmative action, points out that frequently around the world, when we do this affirmative action stuff, it benefits primarily the wealthy. Um, what percent should you be before you get credit for preferences based on your background? Right now, it's open-ended. Should it be an eighth? Should it be a sixteenth? Senator Elizabeth Warren apparently was smaller than a 64th or 128th Native American. She felt that she'd give her preference, apparently, in becoming a, a law professor at, at Harvard University. So what percent should we be looking at? Um, are there any jobs that we should go back to old-fashioned merit-based? How about a doctor? Should we all get the best people we can to become a heart surgeon? I would think so. How about air traffic controllers? How about engineers who are designing bridges? Um, or are all jobs primarily based on ethnic background and not necessarily on merit? Um, as mentioned, this new special interest group uh, put in there by, by President Biden, the Middle Eastern North African group, largely came to this country after affirmative action began. Originally, the idea behind affirmative action was American discriminated against you in the past and you deserve a, a step up to get caught up. Here you have people who were not even in America. So, uh, again, Thomas Sowell, when he talks about these race preference things and these race, race bureaucracies, points out that it always hurts a country when people view themselves as a member of an ethnic group first and views themselves in, in, as a, a, a citizen of that country secondly. I look at Canada, which I think has always had problems to, throughout my whole lifetime, in that it's divided between people who speak French and people who speak English. I look at Nigeria, where we had a division between tribes and a division between the Muslims in the north and the Christians of the south, which result in a civil war and millions of people dying. We look at Rwanda and the hor horrific things happen there as the country's divided into races. India, with its not only ethnic differences, but religious differences. Sri Lanka, which had a horrible civil war as the government began to weigh in on this, on this group and that group. Um, historically, America is stuck with this motto, e pluribus unum, out of, out of many, one. Okay, and we come from all around the world, but we consider ourselves Americans first. And we eventually kind of drop or rarely think about where our ancestry came from. Al Gore twice embarrassed himself by getting the meaning of the pluribus unum screwed up. And he said, out of one many. In other words, we have people right now who primarily consider themselves American. And the Biden administration says, well, wait a minute. You should primarily consider yourself based upon where your great 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 grandparents are from. That's being a that's just a a big mistake. Um, so what can we do here? I think first of all there might there should be more of an outcry over the Biden administration's plan to give what amounts to preferences to Middle Eastern North African people. Um, again, immigrants who came here recently not prejudiced, I'm sure doing very well. I think the only reason you bring them into the loop is if you wanted to destroy America through divisiveness. 
as what has happened in many other countries around the world. Then we ought to get rid of these racial equity committees in which we have government, apparently government bureaucrats whose sole job is to divide Americans or judge Americans or weigh the worth of Americans by their ethnic background. And, and increasingly, it's, when I look at what's going on with the bankers, it's not just going to be ethnic background, it's going to be sexual background as well. Um, is that right? I don't know who could possibly think it's right that the banker has to, at the end of the month, go through the forms that he's accepted as for loans is to say, do I have enough people of the right sexual background? But that is the way we're going in America. I hope we end it. These programs began almost 60 years ago, uh, about, I think now, 57 years ago. Um, like programs around the world, when they began these programs of preferences, they were supposed to be temporary. Like I said, I think when they began these programs in the 60s, if you told people they'd still be around 57, later, 57 years later, you never would have believed it. And you sure wouldn't have believed it if you would have thought we we're going to add all these other groups, most of which were not even in the United States at the time, to the mix. So I hope we have a public discussion on that. I have listed the questions that should be answered. And uh, hopefully it's something that if nobody else, at least the pundit class, can weigh in on. And we can educate our young people as to what is going on. Because I think a lot of these preferences, uh, particularly with regard to jobs of, in businesses that are government contracting, the public is not even aware of. So um, that is. Um, that is summary of what I think is an important issue and ought to be addressed. And I ask to adjourn. <laughs> the gentleman yields back. <laughs> the question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted accordingly. The House stands adjourned until 2 p.m. tomorrow. <laughs>